for a call, press star zero. After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. There are 16 parties in conference, including you. We hope through this uh, to, to give a, a brief glimpse, primarily focused on the solicitor's at, uh, office at, side of the activity. Uh, so we'll be highlighting some of the under, underpinning legal precedents, legal uh, uh, principles involved in the uh, Indian water right negotiation track. There's obviously also a litigation track for Indian water right claims. Uh, we'll be focusing a bit on that, but I believe our assignment is primarily to uh, <clears throat> provide information and experience on the uh, water negotiation side. Uh, I had the opportunity early in my career, I've been in the solicitor's office 20 plus years, to uh, come in on the ground floor on the, a number of these uh, negotiations. I would highlight that. Uh, if, if you're looking for uh, a caseload where you kind of have a clean, nice beginning, middle, and end, that uh, this this uh, this area of the law may not be for you. Uh, not uncommon to, to to be with a case for for many many years. Uh, here on the first slide, we've uh, highlighted uh, some key background. Uh, most of the Indian water right activity actually happens in state courts. Uh, that is because of the McCarran Amendment, which in the 50s was by Congress and waives uh, sovereign immunity when, uh, when states have developed uh, a, a comprehensive water right uh, judicial adjudication process. Uh, that third bullet is the Klamath adjudication where the uh, Ninth Circuit confirmed a two-step process. Uh, in that adjudication for Indian and federal water rights and, and private water rights, we just completed the uh, administrative phase. Uh, the other examples we'll be talking about more, the Snake River Basin adjudication, Hawaii adjudication where uh, a number of Indian water right issues have arisen. One of the things to note about uh, the different adjudications is, as Dwayne said, they go for a very long time. Uh, the SRBA is almost unique in that it actually had an end um, and wrapped up finally, I guess some have, but uh, those for about 27 years. seemed to be a while. It started in 1987 and finished this year. The Oahe adjudication, which is just south, it flows up into the Snake River and uh, from Nevada. Nevada started the adjudication of the Oahe Basin in 1927. It kind of languished for a long time, and then they kind of reinvigorated it when their neighbor to the north started uh, the Snake River Basin adjudication. Uh, I'm not sure if they've wrapped that up yet or not. Uh, the, the part we're going to talk about is finally done. Um, and then uh, just a note on the two-step process, both Oregon and Nevada have that, and those can be quite painful in that they could go through an entire uh, administrative litigation with discovery, hearings, full round appeals within the administrative phase, um, and justice doesn't represent us necessarily in those, um, in that phase. They, we sort of have an agreement they will for Indian, but it, for all the claims for BLM on all our other clients. Uh, we're, solicitor's offices can be the front line for those that litigation. And then once the administrative phase is all over, it basically starts from scratch uh, in the judicial phase. Um, and they can, the judicial phase can completely rehear everything. 
Um, so those can be uh, less efficient. And can be a motivator for uh, Indian or federal uh, claims uh, negotiation tracks. Uh, but we'd like to start out with some background on water rights in general. I recognize that a number of you would likely have this background, but just get us all on the same plane. The uh, first I'd highlight, uh, I don't think it's actually a bullet, but in the water world, we, we, uh, it's important for us to remember that uh, water rights are actually a right to use water in some fashion uh, and not the right to the actual molecules. Uh, states tend to be really uh, uh, focused on their kind of overall oversight of, of water administration. Uh, that comes up in Indian negotiations. We'll talk about it more. Uh, in this background, we'll hit on three, three uh, categories, <clears throat> well, two categories, one with uh, uh, two subcategories. Uh, basically, uh, the prior appropriation rights uh, are developed under state law uh, in the West, uh, somewhat unique approach to having that developed early in the history of the uh, non-Indian settlement of the West, where first in time, uh, and that if you could develop a use of right, a use of water, uh, and put it to what we call a beneficial use. Uh, then you are entitled to, uh, as, as others come along behind you, uh, to have a senior right in times of shortage to what we call call out those juniors and uh, cut off their water supply uh, while yours is being met. Uh, however, it's important to note that uh, the uses are, are based on um, beneficial use. There, there's a the doctrine of no waste. Um, the uh, states define that, and although beneficial use is not a specific element of the federal rights, we'll talk about it in a minute. It is. Uh, it, it's related to how the federal rights are, are determined as well. For both federal and state water rights, there is a priority date, uh, and <clears throat> further uh, for most beneficial use or prior appropriation rights, there is a uh, identified diversion point, uh, a identified type of use, a specific quantity that's associated with that right that gets into that use of fruct right kind of from your first year of uh, law school where uh, it, it's limited to what you can actually uh, use and consume. Uh, then most prior appropriation rights are identified with a place of use, some some irrigate, sorry, some uh, uh, rights for uh, stock water in some states can be uh, in the stream, anywhere in the stream, so it's a little different category there. Right here. Um, and then there are federal, re federal water rights. They can, uh, to some extent, uh, can be federal reserved water rights. Um, those are reserved either explicitly or implicitly by federal law or actions. Executive um, orders can sometimes uh, create water rights as well. Um, basically, those are water rights that kind of are out there because Congress has taken some action that says, at least implicitly, water is necessary. So one of the cases, Capert, uh, there's a pupfish that lives and the National Monument was established to protect the pupfish. Uh, groundwater uses were draining the water away. There's only one little cave where this pupfish happens to live and it was getting dried out. Um, and the Supreme Court said, well, when Congress set aside that National Monument, uh, in favor of the pupfish uh, meant to have water in it. Uh, and that includes a right to prevent others from diverting the water. That's essentially a water right. Um, we also have in-stream flows of certain areas. Uh, it's in order to have the purpose for which land was set aside, you have to have flows in the water. And we'll talk more about flows for fish. But uh, there have also been claims for flows for wild and scenic rivers, flows for um, 
channel maintenance uh, because the river doesn't really stay as a river if, if it doesn't have some high flows. Um, and then there are some specific things, PWR 107, public water reserve. Uh, Congress set aside, or I guess the executive secretary set aside a quarter acre of land around all springs and other water sources on the public lands to prevent monopolization. Um, and so it says the land around the water sources, the number of courts have said that uh, that uh, actually reserved water for there as well because the whole purpose was to prevent monopolization. Um, and then feds can also have state-based water rights. Bureau of Reclamation uh, is required to obtain its water rights uh, under state law. Um, frequently the man man land management agencies will have state-based water rights, especially if they've acquired lands that have water rights attached to them. Um, uh, sometimes BLM's water rights for grazing, states are split on whether or not uh, BLM, uh, since it doesn't own cows, but just owns the land the cows graze upon, can own a water right. Um, but some of those uh, are under state law. We're going to run through this fairly quickly just because we need to get to the real stuff. Um, did I go too fast here? Responding kind of slowly here. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. So keep in mind some of those uh, federal, other federal rights, because as we seek to resolve tribal rights, at times we uh, have, have some intersection with nearby federal, uh, either state-based or reserved rights that can come into play as we're trying to settle Indian water right claims. Uh, the, the foundational uh, doctrine for both federal and Indian reserved water rights goes all the way back to 1908, uh, the Winters case, where the Supreme Court confirmed that the United States reserves adequate water for the, the purposes of a federal or Indian reservation when those reservations are set aside, and that the uh, priority date for those res implicitly reserved rights are, uh, is, is the uh, date of the reservation or treaty. The winters <clears throat> at issue in winters in uh, north central uh, Montana was primarily uh, tribal agricultural water rights and uses, but it has been extended to uh, other purposes uh, as, as we, uh, back to the adjudication point we were making, uh, the, as we go through to confirm the entitlement of tribes uh, and, and quantify those entitlements to water, uh, we seek to confirm rights for, for domestic, that's what DCMI stands for, domestic, commercial, municipal, industrial, on-reservation needs, and then both on and off-reservation and stream flows. There are a few examples of express water rights. Frank noted one that he had a lot of experience with on the Nez Perce Reservation. There was a partial, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a relinquish, relinquishment by the Nez Perce tribe, but uh, in that relinquishment they reserved the springs and fountains on the uh, relinquished lands. Also in the uh, Yakima situation, uh, Congress expressly reserved from the Yakima River uh, adequate or, or a block of uh, water for irrigation for the Yakima Nation. So that was another example of express uh, water right. And just a quick note, sometimes uh, tribes have acquired lands um, and in the Nez Perce they had some acquired lands which had not been taken into trust and they had state-based water rights associated with those acquired lands that were being adjudicated as well. Uh, we, they were not involve us since they weren't trust. Um, key thing here is all that background is why do we get into these settlements? And the big thing is the Indian water rights have a huge potential to threaten the status quo. Um, they're probably senior to most other uses in the basin, and as we said, prior appropriation, the whole thing, the biggest part of your water right is what's the priority date? 
if you're senior, you get it first, and everybody else has to wait till you've gotten your full use before they can dip their straw into the stream. Um, most of the tribal water rights are either the date of the treaty, if they're, uh, it's a treaty-based or executive order reservation. Um, those tend to be very old water rights. Um, and then for a lot of water uses that the tribes have been doing forever, such as water rights for fisheries, uh, for in-stream flows, courts have held that their priority date is, quote, time immemorial, um, which tends to be older than just about anybody else. Uh, we haven't found any older things right. than that. <laughs> In fact, that can even be a, uh, I think Scott's on the phone here, works from, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in the, the Arizona context, uh, some tribes who have been there for centuries upon centuries and have actually done irrigation for centuries have confirmed uh, time immemorial uh, water rights for, for that type of use as well, so it, it can vary, but it's tied to those tribes that have been essentially using, needing water for a purpose uh, for for a, a long, long time. And then the, the other uh, key aspect that makes these prime for settlement is there are senior water rights. Now everybody else, if it's a user to lose its system, but for the Federal Reserve rights and these tribal rights, they're frequently undeveloped, and the use or lose rule does not apply. Arizona v. California's Supreme Court case in 1963 confirmed that the tribal reserved water rights include future, not just present needs. So a reservation set aside in the 1800s being adjudicated in 1963 could get water rights for projected use into the foreseeable future unforeseeable future. Uh, basically, it's based on what the land could uh, demand, uh, not as opposed to um, what is currently, currently usable. Um, and that is very threatening. Um, <coughs> it has, if the tribes come in and actually start developing their water rights, which of course they have a right to do, um, that means some of these long-standing seniors could suddenly find themselves juniors, and there's a lot of investment and uh, such built up around those junior water rights. So there's a huge potential to settle, or motive to settle. Um, the other side is tribes lack the resources to develop water rights. Uh, irrigation systems are expensive to build, develop, and operate. Um, a lot of times tribes were set up on marginal lands, so the uh, payback time for developing a irrigation system on the marginal lands that the reservations were built upon um, it can be very long. Um, and tribes just have traditionally not had a lot of resources for this kind of economic development. So the tribes have a very strong paper water right, but they also have something that they need. So it's a prime, prime uh, thing. And when these federal settlements come in, there's usual federally funding, which is the oil that greases the skids. And <clears throat> For both federal funding and uh, uh, the, the tribe's focus on or need to have access to resources for developing their own water resources, uh, settlement will give them a pro often gives them an opportunity to focus on the tribal priorities for their, their water resources uh, in a way that can't really be established on a pure litigation track. And we, we have a few examples of litigating tribal claims over the past few decades where, yeah, again, tr as, as Frank mentioned, even in the litigation uh, adjudication, they may acquire a significant uh, uh, water right on paper, but without the ability really to develop it or f to uh, prioritize or incorporate tribal priorities into the use of that water. So set 
negotiations give them an upfront chance to incorporate their, their tri tribal priorities, and we'll talk more about that in some specific examples Frank and I have worked on. So we have a process for settlements, and it is actually defined out in a policy document that was issued in 1990. It's called the Criterion Procedures. Um, and it goes through the process for appointment of a federal negotiation team, uh, development of an assessment report, which kind of looks at legal liabilities and tribal needs and water rights, and there's a lot that goes into a, an assessment report, um, provides for negotiations, and then usually there's congressional approval at the end of the day. And Congress is free to ignore everything that we've done in the criteria and procedures. <laughs> Sometimes does. We'll get into that. Um, I would highlight that the uh, cri underlying the criteria and procedures is a strong federal policy uh, preference prerogative to seek to negotiate rather than litigate these claims, but also to be to be a participant in in these negotiations. Um, that that can ebb and flow based on the, each administration, but. This administration has uh, re, uh, reaffirmed on a number of occasions before Congress the administration's uh, policy and intent to, to uh, seek to negotiate rather than litigate. Uh, Fain, is there anything you would like to highlight at, at this point about? Fain is uh, we uh, sort of like yes, yes, we do have a bureaucracy, but it's a very small one and it's a very effective one to the extent they are very uh, very uh, able folks in the secretary's office that oversee uh, several teams uh, policy implementation uh, it's it, it's kind of like being air traffic controller at at O'Hare and LaGuardia at the same time and it's Fain, a little you, more uh, exciting <laughs> so this is Fane and uh, I'll just mention that we have 27 congressionally approved settlements and um, there have been 31 Indian water rights settlements since the first one in 1978, and 27 of them have been congressionally approved. Right now, I think we have 21 implementation teams out in the field working, and so on Nez Perce, for instance, and other enacted settlements, we have um, teams comprised of various departmental employees who are implementing the settlements, and those teams can you know, be in place for many, many years because issues continue to arise over the years during implementation. We also have 17 negotiation teams, um, probably about 12 of which are pretty active, but the negotiations tend to ebb and flow, so we keep the teams in place waiting, for instance, for a court decision to clarify a particular issue so the parties can get back to the negotiating table once they figured out where they're heading. So I'd be happy to answer any other questions and participate as you wish me to. Okay? Yes, Faith. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to turn now, uh, try and illustrate the uh, department's and the solicitor's office participation, some of the issues that come up, and fr frankly, a lot of the uh, you know interesting aspects of, of this uh, corner of, of uh, legal practice. We're going to do that by highlighting some uh, samples from the Snake River Basin adjudication and the, then the, with the Duck Valley uh, that was split Nevada and Idaho, so some of the Nevada side of that will be discussed. I'll let, to turn to the one of the uh, three uh, Indian reservations uh, within the Snake River Basin in Idaho that were uh, brought into the Snake River Basin adjudication is the Nez Perce Reservation located in north central Idaho, right near the uh, Washington-Idaho border, where the uh, Snake River <coughs> leaves the border and heads into Washington State near Lewiston. That's a long time, uh, you know, uh, centuries long homeland for the Nez Perce tribe, uh, who are primarily uh, a fishing tribe. The claims that the United States filed on behalf of the Nez Perce tribe reflected the uh, 
treaty, the 1855 treaty that they had with the United States that reserved exclusive uh, fishing rights on reservation and um, coextensive fishing rights with non-Indians off reservation. Uh, we also filed claims uh, on, on the reservation for needed uh, consumptive uses that we discussed earlier, such as uh, domestic or commercial needs. Uh, those on-reservation claims were not a significant threat, uh, going back to uh, Frank's points about motivators to get to settlement, but the off-reservation were, were, were a significant threat. Biologically, we determined uh, essentially the full flow of the Snake River would be needed and many of its tributaries for uh, assurance that tribal fisheries had adequate biological, uh, hydrologic uh, uh, resources, water, essentially, <laughs> uh, for the fish. So we made an extensive off-reservation uh, uh, in-stream flow claim. Uh, we also uh, had some controversy because these off-reservation springs or fountains that had been expressly reserved, uh, nonetheless, uh, some of those had been uh, not protected and had been uh, in lands that had been patented to private individuals. Uh, without dealing with the reservation of that water for, for the tribes. We had extensive ESA concerns that entered the picture with, this, with the adjudication. Um, if you guys can have a mental map of Idaho, uh, the, the, the Snake River coming from uh, 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 Wyoming <coughs> across the south end of the state uh, and then heading north uh, towards Oregon, there are several large Bureau of Reclamation uh, projects in that area that divert considerable amount of water. Uh, there were ESA uh, salmon listings in the Columbia Basin in the early 1990s, and those uh, through those ESA consultations, it had been determined that uh, those projects needed to uh, augment the flows of the Snake River to, for, for juvenile fish migrating to the ocean. So essentially, as we entered negotiations in the 1990s on Nez Perce tribal claims, the state and local water users were confronting two very uh, overlapping, uh, but from their perspective, competing claims for water to be left in stream rather than used uh, consumptively. Uh, we had other ESA issues that we might touch upon in a minute. I, I, this sort of highlights how, um, to some extent, local politics gets involved. Uh, because the reclamation projects were being folded in, one of the goals of the state was to get Endangered Species Act coverage for irrigators in southern Idaho. Um, other people in the state, timber operators, were also having ESA concerns and how their operations affect uh, sediment and streams. Well, they wanted ESA coverage too. Um, and so the state said, well, in order to have equity in the state, we need to resolve not only the flows issue, but the timber issue. So even though it's, uh, it was not really water related, it got thrown into the mix. Okay, this is a sort of a compare and contrast. Uh, Nez Perce was right in the middle of things and had big threatening um, water right, in-stream water right claims. They had very well-established fishing rights uh, that were the basis for some of the in-stream flow claims. They were right in the thick of things. Then there's Duck Valley. And the Duck Valley tribes were cursed and blessed by their isolation. Um, back when their reservation was established, they were given a little square of land that is exactly halfway um, in Nevada and halfway in Idaho. And the Oahe River kind of comes from Nevada into the reservation, takes a left and heads off into southern Idaho. Um, their reservation was established. The Oahe River provides them with nice water. There's an Indian uh, BIA water project, reservoir, upstream off reservation that is operated primarily for them, although the non-Indians have been stealing their water for decades. Uh, but they get uh, a lot of water out of their uh, 
one off-reservation reservoir. Um, and unlike a lot of reservations, they have an interesting history because they're so isolated and we're off in the middle of the desert by themselves where nobody really wanted it. When the United States started allotting reservations and kind of doing allotment process, they kind of just kept talking about we need to get around to Duck Valley, we need to get around to Duck Valley, but there wasn't a lot of pressure and they really never got around. And so unlike most reservations, the tribes have an intact reservation that all 100% still uh, tribal land within the outer boundaries of their reservation. Um, now, for Idaho, who really cares? They're mainly diverting this from the Oahe River. They have some stock watering. They've got some lemonade reservation claims. There's really only one water user in Idaho that's affected because he's on an upstream tributary. Um, and so this was not a real high priority for the state of Idaho and marginally a priority for the state of Nevada. But just sort of that's where they came from. Now, litigation is frequently a time driver, um, which if you've ever been in negotiations, one of the things I've almost every seen, seen in every negotiation, whether it's a big one like this or a smaller one, is nothing happens in negotiations until there's a deadline. And litigation frequently provides that deadline uh, that drives negotiation. Right, thanks. And, uh for the Nez Perce uh, claims, that was very much uh, a driver. We uh, had an early round. We filed uh, the claims in 1993 uh, for, for these off-reservation in-stream flow claims. We had an initial round of negotiations uh, in the mid-90s that did not result in a settlement. But uh, so, so the court put uh, the parties, we had, uh, gosh, a score plus of objectors to those claims, including the state of Idaho, uh, all of the large irrigation districts, uh, and most municipalities, over 500 people, <laughs> who uh, were actively opposing those claims. So the parties agreed to a summary judgment track. Uh, we actually had a trial court decision in the SRBA finding that the U.S. as trustee was not entitled to those off-reservation claims, nor were the this first tribe was a this first tribe. Uh, that that decision was appealed, but at the same time, right about the same time, the parties uh, recognized that. It would probably be worth another round of negotiation. Uh, we actually found a, uh, an effective mediator, uh, Professor Francis McGovern from Duke University, who was uh, very used to doing complex litigation uh, with multiple parties. Um, so essentially, we were on a parallel track for many, many years uh, doing negotiation and uh, litigation. And we will. Uh, talk in a moment that we did reach a comprehensive settlement, but it very much, just as an example, very much was a driver for us. Um, one sort of note, one of the other parties that actually kind of played a good role uh, was Idaho Power Company. They were one of the objectors. Um, to some extent, they have interests sort of in line with the tribe's in-stream flow claims because in-stream flows tend to run through their turbines. Um, but they also played a convening role. They were one of the parties that really drove getting back to the mediation, and uh, they helped uh, in a lot of ways uh, there. Duck Valley, um, again, it was pretty much just the federal team, the tribe, and uh, pretty much nobody from Idaho ever showed up. Uh, mainly when we'd go to negotiation sessions, we'd have some folks from the state of Nevada and the ranchers uh, down upstream in Nevada. Um, and it was interesting because the tribe 
makes their all, they all make their living ranching. Their neighbors upstream are do the same thing, and we'd have to schedule our meetings around calving time and uh, haying time. And um, but the tribe had the same schedule conflicts as upstream ranchers. So there, you were talking to actual water users. <clears throat> where in the snake, the uh, Nez Perce, we were talking to the high-powered attorneys. Right, and it was just very yeah. low-keyed. Um, rarely did any attorney show up except me. Um, and, you know, everybody's got a cowboy hat on and is showing up in their pickup truck except uh, the federal team. And uh, they're all neighbors. They know and sort of like each other. They just have a different history. Um, but litigation was the driver there, but there really, because it was not a, um, a, there wasn't a lot of motivation on the part of Idaho or anybody in Idaho to settle. When litigation caught up with them, nobody cared. And we'll talk about how the litigation just kind of ran over the whole process. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> go through some of the uh, elements of, of the uh, settlement we did reach with the Nespers trial. Excuse me, getting kind of a, a raw throat here. I get a little choked up talking about these things. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we did initiate a mediated uh, negotiation. That commenced around 1998, I believe. We uh, announced, uh, all of the parties announced a com comprehensive uh, proposed settlement in uh, spring of 2004. Uh, we were essentially the administration, the tribe, and uh, the state and local uh, parties on the same page to the point where we were able then to go to Congress and have that uh, settlement confirmed by Congress literally within the last 15 minutes of, of that uh, session in 2004. The settlement uh, dealt with all of those themes that we were mentioning earlier that arose as we filed those claims in the SRBA. Uh, again, what I'd like to highlight here is that the settlement was a, uh, even though it certainly didn't look like what we would have hoped, uh, you know, our our claims would have would have uh, look like if, if confirmed uh, as claimed, it still, I think, met uh, a significant uh, high point in meeting the tribe's priorities for, for water resources on and near their reservation. First, we confirmed on-reservation water rights. We reached a settlement of these off-reservation springs or fountains that were very important to the tribe. Uh, uh, the ones that are on federal lands, now the tribes have a clear entitlement and right to use those uh, springs. We're not exactly sure what fountains were, or Frank could give you a very technical definition, but uh, point being, we did reach uh, a settlement that allowed uh, those, those claims to be settled in a way that met the tribe's priority. The um, state of Idaho was very clear that they were not interested in having off-reservation federal or tribal in-stream flow water rights. So uh, to the uh, third bullet, the state of Idaho did agree to protect in-stream flows under state law. This was a significant uh, consideration for both the tribe and the United States because technically, uh, you know, at some future point, the Idaho legislature could change its mind but we have embedded those state-based in-stream flows to the fullest extent we can under the law. Uh, they are protective of flows, and they were incorporated as part of an overall program for streams where salmon in the Clearwater and Salmon Rivers uh, currently go to improve areas that, that have been impacted by uh, irrigation and other human uh, water resource development. So the in-stream flow protections weren't quite what we were looking for under uh, our claims, but, but functionally met, met that goal for the tribes. Uh, 
there were significant funds for habitat, again, reflecting tribal priorities, habitat restoration, uh, on-reservation tribal water, uh, uh, water and sewer de uh, uh, system development. Uh, something we didn't highlight here, but I think the tribes felt was a significant uh, uh, plus for them was we negotiated tribal management of some on-reservation uh, hatcheries that are owned uh, and were operated by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'll talk about that towards the end on how, as, as an attorney on the case, uh, attorneys on the case, Frank and I were often interacting with the various divisions in, in D.C. and other experts in, in areas outside of Indian water law to effectuate something like a, a transfer of a, of a, uh, of a ref, sorry, of a uh, hatchery. And as I mentioned, we had a lot of ESA issues. We were able to reach uh, an agreement whereby the state of Idaho would uh, uh, confirm the right of the Bureau of Reclamation to augment flows from its projects and other sources up to about 500,000 acre feet of water per year to assist a juvenile migration of, uh, of salmon. Very important to the state was that equity, they also got this mechanism for ESA coverage for timber and other smaller water users. Um, they had to submit a proposal, but at the end of the day, uh, the state did, did not want to pursue that after all that work. Um, but they, it was there. Duck Valley um, was a different story. Um, what happened there is as litigation got closer and closer, the state of Idaho sent us an offer of judgment, which under Idaho law is sort of an interesting deal. If someone gives you an offer of judgment, say in a tort case, you have to accept it or if you litigate and lose, you don't get as better than, you don't do better than their offer, you have to pay the other side's attorney's fees and costs. And on the other side, if you make an offer of judgment and it's declined and you don't do as well as your offer, you have to pay the other side. So it's this gambling man's, uh, provision. It's very interesting. Uh, we did not believe that uh, any of the costs would apply to the United States. We had no sovereign immunity had not been waived for any of that. Um, but the question is, they came and offered us um, a certain amount of water. Um, now, in the negotiation context, what the tribe wanted was not just water, but they wanted water, the opportunity to develop the water, um, and what's in most Indian water rights settlements, you know, some development funds, um, some compromise, and, you know, it all works out. But this was just, here's your water. Um, open for discussion. How do you guys think of, in, if, if we get this offer of judgment in a litigation context, how, if at all, should the litigators consider the settlement context? Any thoughts? Well, we evaluated it, and actually the offer that the state made was pretty darn close to what we were likely to get in litigation, or a matter of fact, even slightly better. Um, they they followed their rules and, and gave a an offer of judgment that uh, was probably a little better than we would have gotten in litigation. The tribe was vehemently opposed to it. Um, but then what is our role as trustee? Um, do we have a role as trustee, especially when we've got the litigation hat on, to factor in other things or do we have, is our role to protect the legal rights that we're litigating? And the tribe, they, they didn't have their own claims on their own behalf, right? They did not. Right. 
Um, they were, it was only us, only the Fed. We were there as trustee. Um, at the end of the day, um, the Department of Justice and our office um, agreed that this was as good or better than we would get in litigation. And as a litigation matter, um, with a few minor um, adjustments, uh, we accepted the state's offer um, over the tribe's objection. And I got to say, that was, in my 20 years of being in the solicitor's office, the hardest day of those 20 years was walking into the SRBA courtroom and we always walked in and walked to the right. That was where we sat. And we sat on the right with the tribe. And the state sat to the left. And in that one hearing, the justice attorney and I walked up and sat with the state. Um, because in that, and I think it was the right thing but it was the hardest thing I think I've done in 20 years uh, because it uh, really did leave the tribe hanging on the settlement, which again, their isolation is, was in that case uh, a curse. However, um, there, there were happier times to come in the Oahe adjudication down in Nevada, which is where most of their water rights come from, they continued to negotiate. They blocked the federal team out of the negotiations. They met with the state and the water users. Um, we were no longer invited to attend. Um, they went to Congress without seeking any departmental input. The department did. Uh, Congress asked for our input, and we provided input, and they did eventually reach a uh, settlement on the Oahe adjudication in Nevada, which gave them some uh, of the more traditional. But it, for the Snake River Basin adjudication, uh, we just got them a water right. Um, this is Jane. Just to uh, give a little information on the uh, Duck Valley settlement, the tribe is ready to have its settlement agreement executed by the secretary and is prepared to sign the waivers that went along with their uh, enacted settlement. So we're just in the process now of getting those documents together and scheduling a ceremony for the signing of the settlement agreement. Thanks, me. I believe we might be running a bit short on time. Uh, we, we had these examples uh, <clears throat> just uh, to go into a, a, a couple of other issues. I might just highlight, uh, I'm, I'm actually working on the Flathead uh, Reservation negotiations in Western Montana, uh, a lot of similarities to Nez Perce, but, but uh, I would highlight uh, for, for all of these negotiations, um, it, the, the individual settlement is going to be different every time for each each uh, situation, but kind of in the overarching way, they're all the same because they do seek finality and comprehensive resolution, incorporating tribal priorities, and then something in the flathead we've been really focused on is confirming an approach for administering those water rights after you reach settlement. We don't have settlement yet in the Flathead, but we have had to focus, focus extensively, as we have in other settlements, how do these water rights, once settled, get administered uh, in the post-settlement world? Uh, that's kind of its own sub sub subcategory of uh, activity for us, but an important one that can be resolved through negotiation, but not through litigation. <clears throat> then on the Klamath, the Klamath, uh, the Nez Perce, uh, Choban in Idaho, and many others often intersect considerably in one way or another with Bureau of Reclamation projects. And I would just highlight that's, that's a common theme that we see uh, for, for a lot of these where we need 
both the expertise of reclamation, but also at times uh, water, water sources, say from uh, un uncontracted space in reservoirs or elsewhere, to be dedicated to the settlement as part of the overall package. And then just to, uh, to, to wrap up for the, for the solicitor's office folks, uh, DOJ, of course, is the lead in these adjudications. Uh, the uh, agency counsel, uh, my experience, and I think Frank's, is we are very actively involved with justice in preparing and uh, uh, defending claims. Uh, and then, as Frank highlighted, we, we can end up, uh, Barbara Scott Breyer, our colleague here in uh, Portland, uh, for many years has been the, the actual uh, litigating attorney for several uh, agencies in the uh, uh, Klamath adjudication. The uh, the team met we every uh, as far as I know every uh, federal negotiation team appointed by the Interior Department has uh, an assigned a solicitor's office attorney. Uh, I've had the occasion opportunity to act as a chair for some of those, uh, but it's also a, a very coordinated situation where we have many many. Uh, uh, opportunities to work with, with other agencies within the department in addition to just BIA. I mentioned reclamation uh, in our NESPER situation uh, when the tribes floated the idea of having a transfer of uh, hatchery operations to, to be tribally operated. Uh, we had a good uh, Fish and Wildlife Service representative on the team who uh, <clears throat> ensured that we had the highest level of policy uh, involvement and coverage on, on, the, on that, that issue. I've also, uh, and Frank can jump in here, uh, uh, you know, we, you, you often as an uh, attorney on these negotiations run into many areas of uh, the law that the Interior Department is involved in, uh, the BLM uh, land rights and transfers, uh, uh, Bureau Reclamation issues, National Park Service where there's a, a park uh, near the reservation, uh, those can be uh, uh, tough issues to work through sometimes. And so I've had uh, ESA issues, I've had a lot of experience working with the various divisions as these issues have come up. Uh, Frank? Um, I think that pretty much wraps up what we had prepared to talk about. Um, I think this last thing, it's, it's interesting because to some extent solicitors, office attorneys and negotiations frequently do wear two hats. Um, one is as the litigator and one is as the negotiator and sort of departmental structure wise, it's, it's a little different in that when you're wearing your litigator hat, your chain of command goes up to the solicitor. When you're wearing the, uh, team lead or team member hat, your chain of command goes up straight to the secretary's office through the secretary's Indian Water Rights office. Um, and it's interesting how the different roles kind of play out. We have a few minutes for questions. If uh, anybody wants to chime in, comments? All right. We knew we were good. But. <laughs> I want to thank you both for uh, hosting this today for us. Um, it's a pleasure to work with you, and thank you for all the wonderful information you were able to pass out to everyone. Um, Lori, thanks for making it so smooth. Oh, hey, piece, piece of cake by now. So if you have any ideas about brown bags for 2015, I'm putting in a plug. Hit me up, let me know, and we will start building our topics for next year. So with that, um, if anybody doesn't have anything else, we will say goodbye and till the next time. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.